Hi there, and welcome to PhD at Living. We're all hoping to get a vaccine for this coronavirus thing, right? And we're hoping that it's not going to have too many unintended side effects, right? Well, who's going to decide how effective is effective? Who decides what side effects are acceptable side effects? And how do we know the vaccine isn't being pushed through or held up for political reasons? Put a pin in all that right now. This is thalidomide. It's a leprosy drug and also one of the four things you can remember real time while singing Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. Children of thalidomide. In the early 1950s, this puppy was synthesized in Germany and shown to be a magic cure for insomnia and also morning sickness in pregnant women. A couple years later, the drug hit the market and rapidly spread across Europe. In September 1960, with thalidomide in use in over a dozen countries worldwide, the Merrill Company put in an application to the FDA for thalidomide's use in the USA. The application was given to MD-PhD Francis Oldham Kelsey, a medical officer with the FDA who'd only been working there for a month and was given the application basically as a softball first easy assignment. After all, thalidomide was being used across the world and had shown very few obvious side effects. What more was there to ask? However, Kelsey gave the application full weight and found it less than satisfying. Predominant among her concerns was the fact the application was filled with numerous anecdotal accounts of the drug's effectiveness and safety, but very little in the way of actual data. It's sort of like a drug commercial testimonial. It worked for me, so surely it'll work for you. Well, that's great and all, but show me the numbers. Here's another reason Kelsey's an excellent scientist. She sought peer review. To ensure she wasn't being unfairly biased against Merrill's application, Kelsey had her husband, a pharmacologist at the NIH, take a look. After his review of the application, Kelsey's husband called one section, quote, an interesting collection of meaningless pseudoscientific jargon apparently intended to impress chemically unsophisticated readers, end quote. That is just a savage, all-time scientific burn. Damn. For those reasons, Kelsey denied Merrill's thalidomide application. They reapplied, and she denied them again. This dance happened a total of four times because of insufficient data, and Kelsey wasn't backing down. Merrill's representative hounded Kelsey with phone calls, personal visits, and letters, and at one point asked her boss basically if Kelsey had gone rogue. Turns out, in February 1961, the British Medical Journal reported nerve damage to the extremities in thalidomide patients. Whoops! Because of a connection she'd made earlier in her career between nerve damage and fetal development, Kelsey turned up the heat on Merrill by requesting thalidomide data that demonstrated no damage to the fetus. By this time, however, Germany was seeing thousands of babies born with developmental deformities, and thalidomide was suspected as the cause. When new data confirmed that thalidomide was in fact the culprit, Merrill's fifth and final thalidomide application in the United States was rescinded. Worldwide, over 10,000 children were born with developmental deformities and countless other fetuses likely auto-terminated because of the extent of the damage due to thalidomide. In the United States, however, because of the efforts of Frances Oldham Kelsey and her team at the FDA, only 17 confirmed cases were shown, and only then because Merrill had distributed over a million thalidomide pills on an investigative trial basis before FDA approval. From the ensuing public outrage, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 was amended in 1962. Among other things, the amendment required FDA approval before any new drug was marketed, and that all new approved drugs would have proven effectiveness through, quote, adequate and well-controlled studies, end quote. For her efforts, Kelsey was awarded the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service by JFK in 1962. Which brings us back to the coronavirus vaccine. Here's a juxtaposition in my own life. My wife is required to work on site because she's deemed essential to critical infrastructure, so she's potentially exposed to the coronavirus every single day at work. A quicker vaccine would be awesome because it would protect her sooner, but a quicker vaccine might not go through the rigorous testing required to determine any unintended side effects. So am I willing to have a vaccine faster to market because it protects my wife earlier at the risk of potentially exposing her to harmful side effects? These are the impossible questions we're currently facing as a society. They're extremely personal, and the risks on either side could not be higher. Delaying a slam-dunk vaccine would almost certainly result in thousands of preventable deaths, but on the other hand, rushing a questionable vaccine could very potentially lead to thousands of harmful side effects or deaths as well. Going back to our questions at the beginning of the video, how do you figure out how much risk is acceptable risk? Who gets to decide that? 
And this, my friends, is why Frances Oldham Kelsey is every single bit as relevant today as she was in 1960. The FDA is responsible for the regulatory efforts in qualifying and approving any potential COVID-19 vaccine in the United States, and the scientists and physicians at the FDA are 100% aware of the importance of this issue. In a recently released joint article, the commissioner of the FDA and the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, the branch of the FDA responsible for vaccines, wrote, These decisions will be firmly rooted in science. We are committed to expediting the development of COVID-19 vaccines, but not at the expense of sound science and decision making. We will not jeopardize the public's trust in our science-based, independent review of these or any vaccines. There's too much at stake. Imagine if Merrill wasn't required to have independent review before releasing thalidomide in the U.S. Or imagine if Kelsey's boss had caved to political pressure and just fired her to make his life easier. Because of how personal this vaccine is, because of how political the coronavirus pandemic has become, and because of how emotional it makes everybody, myself included, the only appropriate approach to approving this vaccine is through scientific rigor. It eliminates the bias and the emotion and all the messy human parts and only leaves the truth behind. Don't listen to the news, surely don't listen to the politicians on either side, and don't even implicitly trust the scientists, because that's what good science dictates. Trust the data. Trust the facts. They do not care about your opinions, feelings, emotions, or political views. They do not care if you disagree with them or if their presence makes your life uncomfortable. They don't know you need to keep an economy afloat or win an election or get clickbait headline views on your YouTube channel. Data and facts are neither good nor bad. They just are. And they remain that regardless of any other circumstance. This is why the coronavirus vaccine absolutely cannot be politicized or taken over by non-scientists. Yes, I can hear you already. You can make the numbers say whatever you want. Yeah. Sure, that's true to an extent, especially with observational epidemiology. But the studies that matter for this coronavirus vaccine will be rigorously conducted, randomized double-blind clinical trials. And the way those trials are constructed makes it really difficult to manipulate the data. We don't really have the time to get into it right now, but Dr. Peter Atia has luckily already done the legwork for us. This is the second time I'm recommending his Studying Study series, so please do check it out. Link in the description. Yes, I still hear you. Those same scientists you've been talking about have been wrong the whole time, changed their opinions, retracted previous statements, and basically look like they have no idea what they're doing. Well, friends, the Academy might take away my PhD for telling you this, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. That's science! False starts, wrong assumptions, frustrating reversals, and straight-up confusing data are the rule, not the exception! This is the first time a wide majority of the global population has seen science play out in real time, and spoiler alert, it's messy! And here's another free bit for you. Don't be surprised if it continues to be messy for a year plus, because you can't rush these things. When you rush them, you get thalidomide! Two examples here to really hammer home the point. There's a famous story about Thomas Edison trying a thousand different light bulb configurations before he found the one that worked. Think about that. He was wrong 1,000 times before he was correct once. And we consider him one of the best scientists ever. Fauci's wrong twice and people are like, he's a fraud pawn of the fake news media. Number two, Winston Churchill said democracy was the worst form of government except for all the other ones. You can think of the scientific method pretty much the same way. It has its faults, and I would love to adopt something else, but we haven't found anything better yet. A word of caution here in the interest of full disclosure. The FDA is not a truly independent regulatory agency. It rolls up under the Department of Health and Human Services, which is in the executive branch of the U.S. government. If that means president to you, hey, you're right. A couple of examples. If the commissioner of the FDA said there weren't enough data for a potential COVID-19 vaccine to be granted an emergency use authorization, the secretary of HHS or the president could overrule that decision for none other than political reasons. And just so we're not being political, the reverse is also true. If the commissioner of the FDA said there were enough data for a potential COVID-19 vaccine to grant an emergency use authorization, the secretary of HHS or the president, again, could overrule that decision for none other than political, not scientific reasons. 
I know I'm beating this one over the head here, but this is exactly why we need science to be driving the conversation here, not fallible, biased human beings. There are gigantic geopolitical consequences associated with this vaccine, and that's why we need the decisions to be driven by the best scientific knowledge we have at hand. We need to stand firm against biases and opinions that try to sway the truth. We need to go beyond the noise and find the facts that bedrock every good scientific conclusion. And we need to take the time necessary to get this thing right. In short, we need to be more like Francis Oldham Kelsey. See you all next time. Sometimes science is more art than science, Morty. A lot of people don't get that.